about all right so the session is is now recording and i want to say that today we are going to talk about this article implementation of machine learning classification in remote remote sensing an applied uh, review um, and this is a very uh, technical article as you you'll see uh, some of you hopefully uh, most of you will have had a look at this. I, want, I also want to say that um, uh, you guys are responsible to read all the articles that are assigned in the class, uh, regardless of whether you present it or not. Uh, so this is a very technical article, and this is going to be the most technical article that you'll read this, uh, this semester. So the other articles are a little less so. And um, I wanted to have this article. Um, I know it's difficult, but we have students from, uh, first of all, we have students from um, a very many different uh, academic background. So I imagine that some of you uh, would understand a little bit of the article, you know, maybe the introduction and the conclusion. Some of you may understand a little more and some may understand most of it. Uh, so that's the reason of assigning this article so that uh, given the variation in the class, I want for people to be able to take away as much as you guys can, each of you. Now, the second reason, even more importantly so, uh, is because machine learning and algorithmic uh, processing uh, has become so common and so embedded in our everyday lives that I think it's very beneficial for all of us to understand a little bit better what is it that, that you know, happens. Um, there is this other article, we read this one with my students last semester, how the machine thinks, understanding opacity in machine learning algorithms. And if any of you is interested, I will, uh, share that with you guys. Um, this talks about the opacity in machine learning, meaning how things are viewed, how we are told, you know, many times, oh, you know, machine learning and algorithms, this is only for professionals. Um, you wouldn't understand what's going on, you know, don't even try. There is this kind of myth that only computer scientists or only people who are really, you know, really specialized and have the proper education can understand this. And, and there was a time when this was uh, the case. But again, given the pervasive use of machine learning algorithms in practically every area of life now, I believe that it's to the best interest of all of us to understand a little better what is it that we are talking about. Uh, and this article specifically says that, you know, there are these three forms of opacity. Opacity is intentional corporate or state secrecy, right? So um, opacity is used by some corporations. Uh, for example, when you're denied a loan, they can tell you, oh, well, you know, the algorithm just puts you in this category and we cannot give you a loan. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's it, as if, you know, you have to say, oh, okay, so if, if you know, if the machine learning algorithms put me in that, in that category, then that's fine. Um, but at the same time, and, and this is also the case for car insurance, for medical insurance, for you know, credit card applications, uh, for your credit card scores, for, for even for jobs, you know, when you apply, they can tell you, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, you, you know, your application, you know, did not make it because we have this algorithm now that uh, sifts through candidates. Um, so, so this is something that is ultimately wrong, and I, I hope that you guys understand more about this and. Be, and, and you're able uh, to, to question it. If you're on the receiving end of it, and, and we as consumers, as customers, are always on the receiving end, uh, to, to really question this, uh, this attitude. Um, okay, I don't know who this, who this guest is. I have no idea, so I'm not gonna admit that person. Um, okay, so.
the second uh, here in the abstract, the second type of uh, form of opacity is opacity as technical illiteracy. Uh, and, you know, again, that's what we are told. Oh, you know, you can understand these are complicated issues. You're not able to understand how this works. And then the third form is an opacity that arises from the characteristics of machine learning algorithms and the scale required to apply them um, and uh, to apply them usefully. But, you know, the main, I think the gist of this article also has to do with the fact that we need to understand how people are classified in specific categories because many times uh, it's us. It's us that we are classified in a specific category and that may be detrimental to our um, well-being. So there are a couple of other things that I wanna share with you, again, before we, uh, we embark into the presentations of the article for today. Um, so, um, so here is this argument that um, if one is a recipient of the output of an algorithm or classification decision, rarely does one have any concrete sense of how or why a particular classification has been arrived at uh, you know, from these inputs. And so, again, that's why I wanted you guys to learn a little bit more about this, these processes. Um, and also, um, uh, well, there is uh, this argument here. Um, so last time, uh, when we talked about Rob Kitchen's work, if you guys remember, uh, he kind of talked about these two types of uh, camps right, in the most current paradigm uh, of empiricism. Uh, these two camps where one of them is really about people who, I mean, be those people professionals or people who just work with the data. Um, I mean, it could be any, any kind of people working in any discipline who really want just to use the raw data. They are not interested in any theory or other conceptualizations. Uh, they say, well, data is objective and we need to just uh, look at it and see the patterns in the data. Well, um, we can't really do that because the algorithm, there is no algorithmic objectivity more than any other data objectivity that has been argued for in the past. Um, these algorithms, these machine learning processes are created by people. People are behind them. And sometimes people use these algorithmic um, processes, again, to exclude others or to serve the interests of the corporation or of the other government or other organizations that, um, you know, uh, that uh, are using such algorithms. And then, um, again, again, I don't think that we should be like uh, silent and say, oh, okay, you know, if an algorithm had made a decision, then uh, that's, that should be perfect. Uh, it's not perfect by far. It's not perfect by far. Um, and so again, if um, uh, uh, the other aspect of this issue is the shift of algorithmic automation into new areas of what were previously white collar work reflected in headlines like, will we need teachers or algorithms? Well, yes, you know, <laughs> I mean, I won't be entirely surprised as, you know, in, in, in some time in the future, um, it's all become automated, right? You know, you can just click on links and there will be nobody to explain anything or to say something to you guys. Um, so we, we need to understand what is happening and, and why it is happening and, and just to have a little bit better idea about um, uh, this, uh, th these processes. So I just want to show you um, a couple of things further here in this article and then I, I have another uh, presentation. I think um, this is going to put again the, the present um, article in, in, a, in a better context for you guys to understand what we are talking about. So this is the, uh, this, this figure one here uh, is a set of examples of handwritten numbers that a machine learning algorithm, and in this case, a neural network could be trained on, okay? Um, 
you know, we all kind of write in, in various ways. And then on, on the second um, figure here, you can see the handwritten number in eight by eight pixel square, right? And the pixels also play a role uh, in the article that, that we're gonna discuss uh, in a few minutes. And so this is how um, uh, the, uh, uh, this kind of input is represented, right? So there are specific weights that correspond to this matrix and also that correspond to the shades between white and black in this particular case, right? In this particular algorithm. So uh, this is part of the neural network. Uh, model, how the neural network model uh, is um, implemented in machine learning. And so, as I mentioned before to you, um, there is a either, there are either two um, algorithms, I think it's actually right here, uh, a given machine learning algorithm generally includes two parallel operations or two distinct algorithms, a classifier and a learner, right? Um, so the classifier here um, is this hidden layer um, that is um, between the input layer and the output layer. So um, here is the forward propagation algorithm, which is the classification. So you, we have specific input here, and then uh, at the output level, it's classified. And so this is the model that is used either neural networks or uh, some other models, as you know from the article, you know, random forests, date and uh, decision trees, et cetera. So in this case, it's a neural network. And so this is a very kind of basic uh, presentation of how, um, how actually machine learning works. And I found this um, other, uh, presentation, which I think also makes it a little easier uh, to understand uh, this kind of um, technology and how it's been used. Again, if any of you guys is interested uh, in this particular uh, presentation, I will send it to you. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it Again, I think it makes things easier. Uh, so this is from um, Facundo Parodi and, and their lab, trial labs. These are the people behind the lab. And so in this presentation, they talk a little bit about machine learning, types of machine learning problems, step to, steps to solve a machine learning problem. And they also talk about deep learning. We're not gonna go all the way there. I mean, artificial neural networks are mentioned in, your, uh, in the article, or that's the deep learning aspect, and then inside classification, uh, convolutional neural networks. Again, we're not, we're not, that's not gonna be part of our uh, work here. But you know, usually people begin with, with a cat, right? What is a cat? Uh, <clears throat> and you have these different um, uh, photos of a cat. And so the idea is how can you teach, excuse me, <coughs> how can you teach um, an algorithm to recognize a picture, you know, what's on the picture? And so what is a cat is uh, the question, but whereas these uh, pictures here, you know, are very similar, right? You can see the face, um, you know, the ears, the eyes, uh, and, and even the whiskers, uh, you know, here we have different uh, problems, right? So how would a machine learning process deal with occlusion, which is displaying the image in some kind of a partial way, right? So this, you can see this barrier here. So not the entire cat is seen. Uh, diversity, how would the machine learning process incorporate diversity of that particular object that we want to study, right? Um, so uh, that's the second um, aspect of the question here. How would, how, would, how would the machine learning processing incorporate deformation or lightning, vari lightning variations? So all of these then become variables, right? In the uh, inclusion of the, um, 
in, in the work of the machine um, uh, algorithm. So um, here in this presentation, we have the definition, what is machine learning? Well, the subfield of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And that is a definition from 1959. So way, way, way before big data, you know, was even a thing, uh, was even, you know, mentioned anywhere. So, um, and I also want to point out that we are not, this is not going to be a computer science class, right? We are just talking about these ideas because they are important in terms of understanding the technological advances that are uh, all around us uh, in this world today. And, 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 and because this kind of uh, uh, technology of machine learning of algorithms has direct impact on our lives. Um, so it's not just uh, a technical issue, it's a very, very much a social and sociological issue as well. Um, so basically you have, you know, again, the training part of the algorithm, and then you have the predicting or the classification part of that algorithm. So this is uh, something about the big data era. And now data already available everywhere. Uh, we talked about that. We are generating data as I speak right now. Um, so there is a low storage cost. Um, of course, everyone has several uh, gigabytes for free and you can buy as many more as you like at the minimum cost actually. Um, so hardware is more powerful and cheaper than ever before. Um, you know, there, there were times in history where a computer uh, meant uh, to take a whole building. That was a computer, right? The first computers were enormous. Well, now our phone, phones are computers, our smartphones are computers. So as technology develops, as chips become smaller and smaller, um, you know, we, we have this hardware and that is super powerful and just for seconds can answer um, any, any task that is, uh, that is given to it. Uh, again, we have, um, everyone has a computer fully packed with sensors with our uh, laptops and, and smartphones, GPS cameras, microphones, and we are permanently connected to the internet, permanently. Permanently. I mean, not only in terms of our cell phones, uh, but a lot of people have many other smart devices, which we'll talk about in the, less, in, the, in the next segment in the class, in the internet of things, right? Um, people have smart um, refrigerators, uh, you know, all, all kinds of other devices that they can control. They can control even the entry to their house uh, from, from uh, a site. They can control their uh, sprinklers. I mean, everything is um, available pretty much now for remote uh, computing. And then, of course, we have uh, services available in the cloud computing, you have online storage, you have the infrastructure uh, for all that. And uh, all of these applications now that are very easy to use, very user-friendly, you know, YouTube, Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Okay, so um, types of machine learning problems. Uh, we have supervised, uh, unsupervised and reinforcement. So the supervised machine learning is what is discussed in the article uh, that the students are going to present today. So this is learning through examples of which we know the desired output, right? What we want to predict. We know what we want to predict. We want to know whether an email message is a spam or not spam. And we, you know, we really need that nowadays. Uh, because there is a lot of spam, right? And so you have to be able to use this uh, process in terms of um, classifying your email, incoming email messages as either spam or not. Uh, but also a lot of other things can be predicted, right? The market value of, ho of houses, you know, based on square meters, number of rooms, neighborhoods, etc. 
Um, so here they talk about two types of machine learning problems, classification and regression. So the, you know, the simplest, I guess, is, is classification because the output is a discrete variable. If it's a cat or not cat, if it's a dog or not dog, if it's a spam or no spam. Um, so that is kind of the, the way that the uh, process is set up, right? And then the second one is regression analysis where uh, for, this, uh, for this output, you need to have a continuous uh, interval ratio variable. That's what it's called, you know, like price or temperature or income or age or any other uh, continuous interval level, uh, interval ratio variable. And so you basically, while here, you just separate, you know, try to find the best way to, to, to separate um, between two uh, classifications. Here, you have to fit a regression line through the, um, uh, through the observations. And both of these, of course, have been done uh, since statistical theory came into being. And of course, also branches of mathematics deal uh, with this kind of uh, issues. So this isn't necessarily anything new in terms of modeling. But here, the, it's new because of the learning aspect of, of this process. And so the unsupervised uh, type of machine learning is that, uh, well, it says here there is no desired output. Well, there is a desired output, I think, but it, the output is not known from the beginning. Like in a supervised learning model, you know that what you want to predict, you want to predict whether um, an email message is a spam or not spam. You want to know that. Uh, in the unsupervised model, uh, you, you just want to see what classification the, um, this process will lead to. You know, like it says here, I have 20 photos, I have photos, or many photos, and I want to put them in 20 groups uh, or uh, more groups or less groups, you know, depending upon the, um, how, how you set up the uh, classifiers. Um, and so another, another example of this may be that I want to find anomalies in the credit card usage patterns of my customers, right? I mean, that's what credit card companies want definitely to, to be able to do. So there is no prior classification that you are interested in, but you are definitely interested in some kind of classification. And so this is, I thought, very good example of that because uh, it just gives you how you have all these data points and by using some type of clustering mechanism, right? Uh, you end up with these three groups, right? Uh, red, blue, and, and green. And I wanna tell you that um, what I did, I hope that you guys had uh, looked and listened to one of my lectures. I'm gonna go back to that um, after the, you know, during the second week of classes. Um, so that group, that article, we used this kind of um, clustering method where we inputted the data and we used multidimensional scaling, which is one method to kind of determine clustering uh, um, of, of the data points. So this is, this is used even in still, you know, in, in scientific research as well. Okay, and the reinforcement is the third one. I wanna say something about these steps uh, to solve a machine learning problem. Um, so we have these um, different steps, data gathering, data processing, uh, feature engineering, algorithm selection and training, and making predictions, right? And um, we have data gathering. Again, it depends what kind of data um, you want to use. Um, uh, in, in terms of big data, we have a lot of, a lot of data, right? Uh, but also we need to know and we need to have not only quantity of the data, we need to have quality of the data and um, only then we can produce 
accurate models. Um, and so this particular slide of data processing, I find this slide to be um, really just the same as you would process any data, okay? Whether it's big data, whether it's traditional data, we always have to clean the data set first. So you can't just take data and start analyzing it. That doesn't exist anywhere. Big, small data, traditional uh, survey, census, whatever data you have, the first um, uh, you know, type of business is to start working, uh, for example, on missing values. There is a whole branch of statistics that deals with missing, missing data. I know some of you may know more, some less. Um, again, I, I'm not gonna lecture on missing values now, but, but you need to know that it's a very, very um, um, a huge process, huge process, uh, important process, because you have to find out if there is a bias, if there is a pattern associated with the missing values. Because if there is a pattern associated with the missing values, then you have biased data, right? Right here. Um, you know, for example, uh, many surveys miss the highest earners because the highest earners don't want to feel surveys. They don't want to say how much they make. And so that becomes a real problem. So you have a whole group of people that is excluded from the survey or from the data set. And uh, again, that makes the data set biased. So your conclusions are missing a whole group of people and uh, that is a problem. So you have to find out whether these missing values are missing at random or missing at not, not missing at random. There are certain mechanisms to be uh, applied, uh, substitution sometimes. If, if the data is missing at random, that's great. That's the best that you can have. So you can substitute it, you can use um, Bayesian criteria, you can use uh, a lot of other methods to impute uh, missing values as well. So that's that. Uh, outliers also in all types of statistical analysis and all types of data, first you need to see if they're outliers. And you can see that here, right, both in this picture um, and uh, in the graph. You can see that all of these data points here in this graph kind of, you know, stick together and this is a, a, a curvy linear pattern of the data, right? And then you have this one here, which is a clear outlier. So um, usually, you know, we have to, again, look at that. And in most cases, we exclude those outliers because, you know, it happens that um, uh, sometimes observations are really um, uh, that uh, don't correspond to the pattern and they are going to uh, create skewed Okay, skewed patterns, and you're gonna skew your data in a way that doesn't represent the major, the overall pattern. And so, you know, these are, these are the kinds of things, again, you know, as you can see, some of this is based on analysis that have been performed for centuries now with, with, the, with any types of data. And, um, uh, some some of the, the some of the new ways in which machine learning uh, is working. So uh, this is another uh, short example, and then I will finish this, and I will give uh, the people um, a chance to um, continue um, with um, uh, with 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 your presentations of the article. Uh, and so just again to for you guys to see uh, how some of this is done. So here you have um, a set of features, right, uh, to classify spam email. So um, for example, again, you know, these features and they are also different variables that come into, uh, into play. Uh, so here, for example, you, you see these kind of changed words in this way, right? Because for example, uh, you know, a lot of algorithms now know that uh, the combination earn cash 
is uh, a clear uh, feature that says, okay, this, this email is spam email. So of course, those that are interested in producing spam, they know that too. So now they have tried to kind of implement other ways in which to avoid that. And you know, one of those ways is to include uh, um, uh, letters and numbers. So it says number of words that have been changed like this. And also you say you have two of these and it's right here. Then it says language of the email, zero for English, one for Spanish, so it's an English one, so it's zero, and then number of emojis, three. And so this is, you know, this is how some of this, uh, some of this process, um, some of this process works. And so I'll, um, this is the last slide that I'm gonna show you. And as you can see here, uh, in the supervised um, machine learning um, type, uh, you have all of these um, methods that are mentioned in the article that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, right? I, I mean, not all of them, but most of them, that the support vector machines, the SVM, the decision tree, the random forest, the K nearest neighbor, and the artificial neural networks, um, which is the deep learning um, uh, aspect of this. Okay, so let me stop sharing and uh, turn to you guys. Do you guys have questions at this point? No. All right. Uh, okay. So then let's uh, let's move on to the uh, presentations and um, and then we can continue with the discussion, right? Maybe you guys will have more questions uh, after that. So uh, let me see um, who is going to start with the presentation of the article. Okay, Chen. Yeah. All right. Um, so you can you can start sharing. I'm, I'll make you the presenter. I'm gonna uh, stop my video. I'm gonna make you the presenter. Uh, okay. So where are you? Uh, okay. There we go. Well, actually, I can make you presenter. So you can just start sharing your. Uh, slides, Chen. Just start sharing. I think people will be able to see your slides. Mm 